Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Ribbon Communication stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. This company makes IP-based real-time communication security and software solutions to telecommunications carriers, software vendors, and enterprises all over the world. Some companies it works with are AT&T, Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM. It also works with the government, financial, and telemedicine companies. The company is headquartered in Plano, Texas and was founded in 2017. It trades on the NASDAQ and Deutsche Börse. The company was formed in 2017 following the merger of GenBand, that was founded in 1999, and Sonus Networks, founded in 1997. It has over 1,000 customers, over 900 million of revenue projected for this year. It's in 140 countries with over 1,000 patents. So far this year, it has renewed 80% of its maintenance contracts, and its revenue is 45% in the U.S. and 55% outside the U.S. It's focused on large market segments like optical transport, IP switching and routing. It helps businesses develop a way for its customers to save information to the cloud. Not just saving to the cloud, but also providing security and speed. Mobile traffic is expected to grow 4.5x by 2026. This company has disruptive technology and analytics, machine learning, and automation. It is a trusted company since it works with the largest service providers and enterprise customers. Also, it has diverse product strengths. It services really big markets such as the 6 billion IP routing industry, 8 billion optical transport segment, and 2 billion secure voice IP market. Its software allows up to 700 phone calls per second and is used at universities, hospitals, and call centers. It also makes sure legitimate calls are allowed in and security threats are kept out. Its software can help phone carriers block robocalls or label them as spam when a call comes in. Its software can work with almost any company's current infrastructure. There is really strong demand for bandwidth accelerated by COVID-19 with increased federal funding. A lot of opportunities with 5G mobile technology and since India was hit hard by COVID during the first quarter of 2021, in the second half of this year or in 2022, that will be a big potential market for this company. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 1.1 billion market cap. They're trading at 760 a share and they have 147 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they did have negative free cash flow in 2018, but positive after that. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was negative in 18 and 19, positive in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. Revenue is the sales for the company. And that grows quite a bit from 600 million to 900 million. Here's a breakdown of their 2020 revenue. 34% is from hardware, 33% is from maintenance. So 67% of their revenue is from those two areas. Software is 22%. Professional services make up the smallest amount of 12%. So there may be opportunity there. Their big revenue generator is from service providers, mainly mobile carriers. That makes up 70% of their business. 30% from enterprises. And they're doing a good job leveraging their technology in other countries. They used to have more than half of their revenue in the U.S. Now it's more than half outside the U.S. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that was over half a billion for the first time in the trailing 12 months. Below that is operating expenses. And their big operating expenses are research and development and marketing. Then below that is their operating income. So you can see they had negative operating income in 2018, a small positive in 2019. Now that their revenue is a lot higher, they have stronger operating income. So about 600 million to 700 million of revenue is about the break even point for this company. They pay 25 million of interest on their debt. That's the most interest they paid in a 12 month period. They have a lot in other income and expenses. 123 million in 2019 from an asset impairment. That's why they had negative net income in 2019, this large asset impairment. But that's a non-cash item, so it won't affect cash flows. They also had a big positive in 2020 and in trailing 12 months. That's why they had so much net income those years. Their net income should have been a lot lower, around 10 or 20 million. 
This 80 million and 62 million in other income and expenses is attributed to the sale of the candy platform. They sold their candy unit to a company called AVCT for $85 million. And they received 66 million of debentures and 19 million of warrants. Debentures are just unsecured debt. The mortgage on your home is secured debt because your home backs the debt. If you don't pay the monthly payments on your mortgage, the bank can take your home, sell it, and use the funds to pay off the debt. Debentures are unsecured debt, so there's nothing backing the debt except the faith that the company who issued the debt will pay it. Warrants are just long dated options. The net assets for Candy is 1.3 million. Since they received 85 million, they're booking 83.6 million as a gain in other income and expenses. But all the numbers and other income and expenses will be stripped out on cash flow from operations when we look at the statement of cash flows. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses or generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So they did have positive operating cash flow every year except 2018. These are all the numbers that feed into the operating cash flow number. So you can see in 2018 and 2019, they had negative net income. But the reason they had positive operating cash flow in 2019 is because we have to add back that $164 million asset impairment because that's a non-cash item. An asset impairment is just when you decrease the value of an asset on your balance sheet and pass through the loss onto your income statement. And the company had similar net income and revenue in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. Yet operating cash flow was double in 2020 when compared to the trailing 12 months. The main reason is in 2020, they had negative 29 million in payables, but in the trailing 12 months, it was negative 70 million. When you buy a product on credit, but you don't pay for it, that increases your accounts payable for that period. But when you actually pay for the product, then you have a negative in accounts payable. So every year they have negative in accounts payable. So they must have bought a lot of merchandise on credit prior to 2018. We can't really change anything about these numbers. We could just try to understand them and make the best decision whether we want to invest in these companies or not. They don't spend too much in capital expenditures, 26 million in the trailing 12 months. They're not a manufacturing company where they would have to build factories and buy expensive machinery. A bulk of their expenses are spent on research and development. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. They did have negative free cash flow in 2018, but it looks like things are improving because it's been positive after that. In 2018, 2019, and the trailing 12 months, they pretty much paid down a similar amount of debt as they issued, but in 2020, they added about $330 million of debt. They added the debt in 2020 to acquire ECI Telecom Group. Because a lot of companies aren't sitting on several hundred million dollars of cash that they could spend on an acquisition. If they are sitting on a lot of cash, it's generally to buy something or to pay down debt or for a specific purpose. Outside of those specific things, they want to use that cash to grow the business because that's what they do. They make products and sell services to generate revenue. A company like Berkshire Hathaway sits on a lot of cash because they want to be able to acquire a company for cash when they want to and get the best deal. That's what they do. They acquire other businesses. This company makes products and services. So that's why they had to take out a lot of debt to fund this acquisition. But as long as the return on the investment for this acquisition is greater than the interest payments they pay in their debt, it's a good thing. And that's the idea when you acquire a company. Although that's not always the case, but that's the idea. This is the equity section of the balance sheet and they generated nearly $1.9 billion from selling stock. That's from the IPO and all the capital raises after the IPO. But their retained earnings is negative $1.2 billion. Retained earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes. That's not good, they've been losing money historically but it seems like they're making money now. So it does take time for companies to become profitable. So if they continue growing and making money, they can wipe out this negative. Let's look at their capital structure, 640 million of equity, 470 million of debt. Their 58% equity, 42% debt. Their net debt is 363 million and their WAC is 8%. And that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's 1.6 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $1.4 billion. We divide that by 147 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 934. They're trading at 760, so they're trading at a 19% discount. It's a buy according to the model. I did have a hard time valuing the company's future because they did struggle a lot in the past 
and they are becoming profitable, but I'm not sure how long that will last. So what I did, I took the average free cash flows for 2019, 2020, and the trailing 12 months, which was 50 million. I grew that by 20% for the next three years, and then I grew it 2.5% in perpetuity. That's how I came up with my valuation. I think they can do a lot better than this if their plans are executed perfectly. Of course, there's a lot of hiccups in the road, and I would need a little more time for this company to prove that they can be successful. Simply Wall Street is a lot higher than me. They're at $17 a share. They're saying the stock is 55% undervalued. One analyst priced this stock and their price target was $13. This is a stock price the last 12 months, so it is up overall. It did peak at about $12 back in February after their earnings call. But when a stock is driven up quickly, a lot of people generally take in the profits and the stock price comes down. But it's still trading a good amount higher than it was last July. February was their big month. You can see there was a lot of selling at this time. The company was struggling when it was Sonus Networks. They did two reverse stock splits. This is a one for five reverse stock split. Companies generally do a reverse stock split so they don't get delisted. If their stock price is getting close to falling below $1 a share, they'll do a reverse stock split to get it higher. Because if it goes below $1, it may trade OTC. And when you trade OTC, you generally don't get as much visibility as trading on a major stock exchange like the NASDAQ. Their beta is 1.1, so the stock pretty much moves with the market. The company has done really well the past 52 weeks, up 98%, much better than the S&P 500 at 38%. The low was 361, the high was 1125. The stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. When the 200-day moving average crosses above the 50-day moving average, which this has, that's called the death cross. That's a bearish signal. About 400,000 shares have been traded on average the past three months. They have 147 million shares outstanding, 69 million are on float. So they have a low float percentage. That means a lot of shares are held by insiders or larger institutions and cannot be purchased by other people. The shares on float can be purchased by people like me and you. 68% of their shares are held by institutions and 3.35% of the shares are shorted. This stock has done really well the past year, much better than its industry in the market, but has really struggled the past three years and five years. Analysts are bearish on this stock, forecasting their earnings to decrease 74%, but their revenue to increase 5%. That seems odd, and I'm not too sure the reason why. The only thing I could think of, they may think the net income is inflated from that large other income and expenses. In the past five years, their annual earnings decreased 14%, which is much worse than its industry and the market. JP Morgan owns 34% of the stock, then Swarth Investments owns 17.5%, Paradigm, BlackRock, and Vanguard. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 33, the median is 22. PE is stock price over earnings per share. They have a really good PE at 14.5. But if you pull out the gain from other income and expenses, they would have a terrible PE. Because the way you calculate PE is the market cap of the company over the net income and their net income was a lot higher due to that large other income and expense item. They do have a good price to sales ratio of 1.3, so investors are paying $1.30 for $1 revenue, much better than a market median and average. Their price to book is also really good at 1.7, but price to book is keyed off of equity. Equity is on your balance sheet, it's assets minus liabilities. They have 640 million of equity, but negative tangible equity since they have a lot of intangibles on their balance sheet from all the acquisitions they've done. So that means they have negative tangible book value. Their return on invested capital is only 4%, a lot lower than their WAC. Their interest coverage ratio is 1.7, so that's pretty close. But I imagine over time they're going to improve their operating income and this number will get better. They have a good ROE at 12% and a good current ratio of 1.3. Their current assets are 100 million of cash and 200 million of receivables. So they do seem to have enough funding to get through the next 12 months without taking on any more debt. They had 29 million of free cash flow and 100 million of working capital. So they have $130 million of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 13 companies in the same industry as Ribbon. And if Ribbon has a number in blue, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they have really good ratios. They're pretty much better in every single category. They do have a low market cap, a little over 1 billion, much lower than average of 65 billion. Most companies in this industry pay a dividend since they have reliable and consistent revenue coming in. But this company just became profitable, so it may take a few more years for them to pay a dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 19% discount. I'm not 100% sold on this company. They did have their struggles in the past, but they're profitable now, so that's a really good sign. And they've been acquiring other businesses and growing their brand. Plus, they're doing a great job at scaling to the international market. There is a lot of competition in this space. 
But if they stay on this track, they might have a 10 billion market cap in three, four years. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.